for the first time in this podcast's existence, there is a new Marvel movie. Can you believe it? <laughs> I, I, we finally did it. We, we, we've explored infinity. We've explored infinity and we've made it to this point. We made it to the new, the watchers have watched. It's, <laughs> I, I don't know how else to say it, but it's epic. But yes, you're right. We did it, man. We did it. I'm pretty sure it's been so long since I listened to it, but I'm pretty sure our very first episode we just kept saying like, yeah, this will tide us over until Black Widow comes out. We'll just, re- <laughs> we're finally there. Wow. Yeah. yeah. You know, we were, yeah, we were talking about how like we had this beautiful plan that like, yeah, we'll get to Black Widow at such and such time. And then the delays happened and, oh God. But, uh, but man, Marvel is just on a, on a war path. Nonstop content back to back. We get uh, we get Falcon Winter Soldier, we get One Division, we get Loki, we get we're gonna get What If, and then we're gonna get Sang Chi. We got Black. Like it's just nonstop, and it's so good. But this was a movie. This was like the last. Okay, if you take away all the Disney Plus, like all the Disney Plus shows, and you focus on you focus on just the movies, the last movie we saw was Spider Man Far From Home. That was the last movie we saw. That's right. It has been. Since then, the world has caught fire multiple times. Regimes have been toppled and rebuilt. Parliaments have been stormed. You got married. Like, yep. the, the, I, I got a blister at one point. There's so you had much. a birthday. I had a birthday. <laughs> I, and I think I may have had two of them. It's been <laughs> insane. <laughs> that's it and this is infinity rewatch of course even though this is the first time we're talking about a movie that we haven't rewatched we're talking about a movie that we just straight up watched um but infinity watch was already taken by a bunch of hacks (laughs) at some company i'm andrew fantasia what's up guys i'm ryan j whitehead and this is black widow Mm. Da, da, da. Black Widow. Now, we we had an initial plan, Ryan, and uh, our yeah. initial plan was uh, because we couldn't, you know, safely go to the movies because it is Canada and we still can't do that. Um, our initial plan was to synchronize watching it just like we do with the the shows, and we were gonna hit play on Disney Plus at the same time and then giggle like school kids and be like, "Oh my god, did you just see this thing?" <laughs> um, yeah. But, but uh, I was filming a movie all weekend, and the movie schedule kind of got shifted around, and it was just not possible for me to watch it when I was supposed to watch it. But uh, luckily, because of the remoteness of the way we watched it. I'm just happy that it didn't cause any delays on your end because I would have felt bad. So you got to watch it at 8 p.m. on Friday night, as was the original plan. How did it feel to sit back on your sofa and press play on a brand new Marvel movie? <sighs> oh, man. Um, you know, I know why you asked this because I just talked about it, but I'm going to talk about it again anyway and try to deliver the same genuine feeling. Um, so, like, you guys, this is, like, exciting because – as Marvel fans, as fellow Marvel knights out there, um, you know, when the new movie time comes, it's such a tradition uh, amongst fans. You know, you you have everyone has their thing, which is you either watch, you try to watch the entire Infinity uh, Infinity Saga and and catch up to the the movie before, and then watch the movie that way. And that's always like everyone has their thing. And for me. Yes, this was going to be exciting. We were going to synchronize and we were going to watch together. Um, but for me, it was it was just such an exciting time. I loved watching these movies with my brother. My brother and I, we would go to the pre-screening for every single movie uh, the night before, like the night before the actual release and go with the crowd and just get that whole experience. Um, with Black Widow, it was different, but it was still nice to just be excited for Black Widow because it's like, this is the movie. Like this, these movies are like the big events, right? And so for me, we, we were getting ready. We came in, uh, you know, I, we, I got this, my favorite pizza, which in, in our area in Toronto, Canada, I go to this one place in the GTA, it's called Mickey's deep dish pizza and they're pizza pies. So they're actually like, they're like this thick 
and it's like cheese and then your toppings more cheese it's like the biggest most massive pizza we have deep stop. dish in the gta and you're only mentioning this on the podcast now <laughs> i'm so sorry i am so sorry but uh but i will take you and you will love it uh but yes it is it's it's a trip it's a trip to oakville which i i no longer live anywhere near um <laughs> but fun fact actually in my old home uh in my old home when i lived with my parents uh we we actually lived uh, in within walking distance of deep dish pizza. And I only found out about it like on the latter end of my like living in that house. Oh, damn. Yeah. So, <laughs> but Mickey's, Mickey's deep dish pizza. Now it's called the hungry dragon and it's, it's absolutely amazing. I will take you one day, my friend, you get a baby dragon and it's, it's the, it's, it's the price of an extra large pizza, but it, the, literally the pizza is like that big Holy and shit. it's so good. And for those of you who can't see, I'm just gesturing uh, if you're listening to this via podcast, I'm gesturing. It's like, think of... Um, you're, you're gesturing like you're holding a full-on oh submarine sandwich. I'm trying to sandwich. think of like... Think of a cake. Think of a cake. That's how big the pizza is. Like, that's that thing is massive. Or like pie. I don't even know why I didn't leave that one. Pie. <laughs> but it was that's great. Nice. So so in the end, we started at... We started, yeah, roughly around 8 o'clock and then watched it. And it was just it was just awesome. I, my wife was with me. And and my mother in law and I was on the edge of my seat. It was just great to have that atmosphere of that new movie and just watch it, despite despite the fact it was on Disney Plus, which is awesome, by the way. I do miss seeing a movie in the theater because there's. I was talking with a coworker of mine, uh, Sasha. He went to see it in the theaters because he has he's already in the, that level of um, uh, open uh, his his uh, areas at that level of openness where they can go to the theaters. And I do miss going to theater, but the fact that on premier access guys, I could just keep watching black widow. I could, I could watch it right now. If I want, we could watch it right now. Just hit play and go. It's awesome. Yeah. That's uh, that's something I didn't know about premier access until you brought it up and I'm like, Ooh. and now the cheap part of my brain, the frugal part of my brain is thinking, should I like go play it like three more times? So I get my money's worth. <laughs> <'Cause>, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like 30 bucks is a big old price tag for one movie so i'm like maybe i should do that um but that I'm, I'm glad you got to to flip it on at the right time and you got to enjoy it well i'm gonna side note you there because i split it with my brother so it's 20 bucks each because we Ooh. share an account nice so so it's clearly it's it's not even a question of like that's like the best value you can get <laughs> so if you watch it one more time you've already gotten your money's worth you're oh golden. hell yeah yeah. easily <laughs> which i which i will because i will watch this movie again like we're gonna get into it guys but i i easily will watch this movie so how how about you fantasia how did you get to uh watching it well i was um there was a, a little window of time there was a point on saturday where i had a big enough window of time where i could have gone aside i wasn't needed on set and i could have watched it but i had um without spoiling anything I, James Brazile, Pesafina, Rebels Come Podcast. He's making a movie uh, and I am in it and it is a horror movie. And uh, the stuff that I had to do was very, very dark. So I could have watched it at one point, but then it would have taken me out of the headspace I needed to be in to, to perform the way I wanted to perform. So I was like, I better not because I know this movie is just going to fill me with joy um and whether or not i even end up liking it i was just like i'm gonna see a new marvel movie and it's gonna have black widow and i'm gonna walk away from this joyful and i didn't i couldn't be joyful and give a good performance it just wasn't gonna happen so i had to forego it and i had to wait till i got home uh sunday night at like 9 30 at night i finally put it on uh but it was well worth the wait and even though it was on a small screen i don't have a huge tv so it still counts as a small screen it felt it felt without demeaning anything we've been watching since January it felt more special than what the Disney Plus shows have felt like every time I turn those on and that's not to poo poo them at all cuz i would i would never do that but it just it felt like yeah this is this is something else this is the bread and butter of marvel you've been you've been eating the veggies and the veggies have been great this is the bread and butter now and you feel that right away the second you click play. 
Yeah, I, I I would definitely use that kind of a similar metaphor that like with the Disney Plus shows, that was like definitely the the high end appetizers. Mm-hmm. And this is definitely the main course. And it's uh, it's good. Um, so let's get into it. Uh, just for be warned that spoilers are ahead. But I take it you guys are fans like us. So you're going to be watching it as soon as humanly possible. But if you haven't had the chance to and you're listening to us first, thank you. um also uh for those of you who are new don't forget to smash that subscribe button uh hulk smash it uh because uh, of course we always come out with the latest marvel content uh as best we we always come out with the latest marvel content in the best quality so that's definitely one of the things we do there so make sure you subscribe and leave us comments down below now that being said um yes it was to me I think my coworker did say it best. This was kind of just like the classic Marvel movie feel. That's what this this movie delivers. Is the classic Marvel movie feel. Um, to me, it kind of reminded me of Iron Man for some reason. Just like the first Iron Man movie with, with how grounded yet superhuman it was. Um, and... I will say the Cold War spy feel that they went for worked for me. Like that intro was awesome. The the intro, I'm so glad you brought the intro up. Um, this whole scene with the family living together in Ohio it was just, even though, you know, as a person who's familiar with this character, like I know I'm watching a flashback, I you know, it's not like I'm staring at this wondering who are these people? Like I I know what's going on. I have the gist of what's happening, but even still the whole time it was just wall to wall tension for me, just like the kids playing in the park. And then like, come on, let's, let's set the table for dinner. Dad's coming home soon. Like every single second, I was just like, something's going to go wrong. This feels really, really tense. And there was, uh, this ties into, I think my biggest, compliment um or like my biggest takeaway of this whole movie in general and it is it is a compliment even though it might sound like it's not is it's so quiet and i think that that's exactly what it needed to be as a spy Mm -hmm. movie it's very quiet and a lot of the bombast a lot of the huge story beats and the marvel hurrah moments they don't come from you know, Stormbreaker shooting lightning or people shouting Wakanda forever. It comes from these quiet moments that are so deathly quiet. You can hear a pin drop and they get you in that right state of mind for those things right off the bat with this family thing. And they even did something. And Ryan, my God, I cannot stress enough how happy I am that they did it. Opening credits. I don't understand what happened to the world where everybody just decided they were too impatient for opening credits anymore. But I swear they make every movie better just by existing. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they had that beautiful, um, re, what do you, (laughs) not remix, but like that beautiful cover of, uh, smells like teen spirit going on. The, Oh, I, that opening credit scene has become one of my favorite MCU moments, period. I I got to give a lot of props to the opening credit scene. You're absolutely right. I kind of forgot that we don't really do them as much anymore. And it's, and it's, it's definitely kind of makes it like in uh, it kind of, it just kind of makes it feel like a movie, but like at the same time, it still immerses you in, in a weird way. Um, it kind of feels like you're opening a comic book is, is exactly what it is. Cause you're going through the opening credits, then you get into the content and then you close it. But that whole process, as you're going, getting into it, you're getting into it emotionally. And then you go through the experience with the characters. And then once the end credits come up, it's kind of like taking you back to that, that like just bringing you back and saying, okay, that's the roller coaster ride. Hope you enjoyed it. And, you know, thank you for coming. This is Top Gun, boom, and that's it. But 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 for me, in terms of the aesthetic that the title credits brought, it really kind of introduced like the the theme of this kind of Cold War spy espionage experience because the the font they use, the tones, the the way they 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 brought in like the names and everything, it felt so edgy and cool. Like oh man, but um, 
Yeah, it was. I mean, it was a smart per- time period to do it. And it was interesting how the movie kind of kicks off with them being chased. And then, you know, as we get into the movie later on, it turns into them chasing. But the consistency of the pressure of chasing to or being chased to chasing is consistent through the entire movie. Yeah. It, it really is like it's you you're right there's a certain point i guess in the middle somewhere where it stops being about people chasing natasha and starts being about natasha chasing people yeah and that was a really cool kind of switch through and i guess that midpoint would happen during the jailbreak mm. scene because at that point the the power scale kind of tips and now natasha is proactively seeking out answers as opposed to being hounded by all these forces that's a yeah. that's a really cool catch there, dude. I like that a lot. Yeah. So so kicking off the introduction, it was nice to get kind of like the 1980s feel. I mean, if I'm a sucker for that kind of that time that time frame. So it was well, that just was nice 95, see- I think. Her flashback. Oh, sorry, not, or, yeah, but we all know the 80s kind of bled through the early 90s. <laughs> so let's, let's let's get real with that. So as this whole thing's kicking off, um, as this whole thing's kicking off. Uh, yeah, there's kind of this air of mystery of like, okay, what's like, what's chasing them and why do they all of a sudden have to leave? And the cool thing is, is of course, like they just throw in shield for the good fun of it. It was nice to see shield chasing after them. I love the, the airplane getaway. Like that scene was just so fun to watch. Uh, it was great to see David Harbour kind of flex his, his super soldier ability a little bit and be able to do small things um to do like some small things but uh but but the the action of that was so unique and fun like this there's this family struggling like just to escape and you know the uh, Rachel Wise bless her heart looking as beautiful as ever um you know ch- 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 like trying to tell Natasha like oh yeah do this do this pull on the sticks as hard as you can and David Harbour's on the outside on the plane just like shooting people on the wing and uh, I honestly thought like oh man are they gonna ditch him is that how he gets into is that how he gets into prison and then like he makes it and, oh man it was, I was all over the place on that one I love how Kate Shortland directed that scene not as an action scene but as like a tense frightening thriller and I yes. think a really smart choice that she made um, was to keep the shield agents' faces out of view. We never got to see their faces. And right. because it was just this faceless sort of government entity that was on their tail, it made it scarier. It, it, it kind of put us in the mindset of these kids where it's not like, woo, this is a fun adventure. It was like, oh my God, my mom and dad are in trouble and my mom just got hit by a bullet and some scary men with guns are chasing us. This is horrifying. I'm going to live with this trauma the rest of my life. And that mm-hmm. that could have so easily been filmed the wrong way and just been like, hey, fun. So I'm, I got to give kudos to Kate Shortland for making that choice to keep that scene like dark and creepy because I think it needed to be. That, that's not something you should put kids through. And that's why... Uh, Natasha and Yelena are not uh, the happiest people in the world. No, it, I mean, this movie does a great job of, of of not only being a Marvel movie, but it also sticks to the Disney thing, which is the theme about family, right? And that seems to, it seems to play through this here, but they do a really good job of showing how dysfunctional a family could be, um, but, and, and how, how traumatic uh this this family is which is uh this family what this family goes through um and it was it was you know uh it was after that scene we get into uh i I, i'm pretty sure we get into uh natasha on the run and i thought we'd get a little bit more of mr thunderbolt ross to be honest with you i don't think he got a lot of screen time in this film to be to be fair no you're right he was pretty much a cameo and I think the second time you see him at the very end, he's got one line and that's it. So he was, yeah, he was, he was our Marvel cameo pretty much. He was our MCU cameo character mm-hmm. and that's cool. Like he was there. They keep reminding us he's there. Uh, I like that. I like that they keep throwing those Hulk characters in. Cause that's what I want to see. Don't, don't forget to give love to the Hulk side of the world. Cause it's still there. Yeah. I think it's nice to see that Ross has still a very much an important role in the MCU because the fact of the matter is, is that these characters 
like it's like you said like incredible hulk in the end is still a good movie it's still mm-hmm. a fantastic movie it's definitely different now that we're deep into ruffalo being the character but you can't discredit the fact that like incredible hulk had an amazing villain it had an incredible story and it's nice to see that they're still using ross in as a representative of the u.s military and it seems that um and what i like about this is like he's enforcing the accords and you know he's, he's it seems like he's also you know uh He's, he's kind of doing this whole Task Force X thing. Uh, not that if they're copying DC, but like that, that, that he might be, you know, putting his own super squad together to kind of combat these things. Because he seems to be always outwitted and outplayed and outmatched by these, uh, these characters. So he might start recruiting some peeps of his own. Uh, who knows? But we shall see. Who knows? Maybe uh, Allegra, uh, Allegra is a part of... Uh, part of Ross as like a, a Coulson to, uh, to the Nick Fury. Ooh, those two, man. That's a deadly combo. That is, I mean, so we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later on, but to me, it just felt like Ross was, though it was nice to have him and I was excited to see him there. He didn't have that much screen time. No, he didn't. Um, and I, I guess, you know, when I heard that Ross was going to be in the movie, I, I guess I figured it wouldn't be, all too much because mm. I assumed it was just going to be about her past. And I figured her past is mostly in Russia and he wouldn't really have anything to do with it. So I didn't think he would figure into it too prominently. Um, I was just more yeah. worried, like are the characters from her past going to be interesting? Cause I didn't know anything about them going into it. And I was like, is it just going to be a bunch of like Russian mobsters and track suits? Cause that's not fun. <laughs> That's like Green Arrow shit. Like, who cares? Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it ended up being way more interesting than I could have hoped. Well, yeah, it, and 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 again, like once we, I, I like seeing Widow kind of like completely outsmart Ross in the most amazing way. Um, but what I also like to see was first of all, in in I'm going to say it right now, guys. Florence Pugh stole the show. Like she. <sighs> Every scene she she was in in this movie, she owned and she destroyed. Um, she was her accent was good. Her her every scene her emotions were so genuine. I think as a I think in my in my opinion with in terms of Marvel characters and seeing the translation to the screen, um, I think from a from a comic book fan standpoint, she is new to the scene, but she would never missed a beat. Like she just hit the ground running. And every scene she's in the movie, it's one consistent performance, no drops, but the intensity is there and just comic book feels are all there. And she's so fun to watch. Um, We get to see her kind of in widow mode uh, in the beginning, you know, hunting down an ex-widow agent there. And the fighting is in for someone like me who appreciates fighting at the scale they do it in. Um, uh, Florence's fight scenes are just gorgeous to watch. Like they are just so fun. Dude, I have had a crush on Florence Pugh ever since I saw her a couple years ago in Midsommar. Mm-hmm. And like the, uh, she had to do such heavy, dark stuff in that movie that it was such a breath of fresh air to see her do something so much lighter here. And the second mm-hmm. she came on screen, I was like, oh, it's Florence. And you're right. She just, she took off. And then every single time she was there, I'm just like, I'm laser focused on her. And I'm like, Oh my God, she's so much fun. And I love this choice that she made where, you know, yes, she's a widow. So she's extremely dangerous. She's extremely competent. She could kill you with a pinky finger if she wanted to, but because of the dynamic of that family that they had, and because of how traumatizing that experience was for her and how formative it was for her, as soon as she is in contact with those people again, with Natasha and then the fake mom and fake dad, you can see that little girl, that little kid start to come trickling out. And it, it's it, psychologically, it makes total sense. It is the perfect choice to make for that character. And it also just made her so much fun. Like, She's when she's sitting in that car with Natasha and she's talking about her vest and she's like, I knew you'd like it. It has so many pockets. Look, 
I'm just like, this is my favorite character now. This is this is it. This is the greatest thing. Everybody, by the way, everybody prep yourselves. You're going to be hearing a lot of Russian accents for the remainder <laughs> of this podcast. I'm just saying, right, it's going to happen. We're going to slip into character. There's no avoiding it. But she oh, yeah. is, she is as as wonderful as ever. She took this character exactly where he needed to. Like, I don't think you could have played Yelena any better than she did. She was I could not imagine. I could not imagine a better performance. It was oh man, she just she crushed it. Like and and, and like the jab she does in the in like the kind of comic. I'll what I'll call as the comic book jokes. Um, she does in it are just so relatable, but at the same time they're so fun. Um, like the the one where she talks about how she's a poser because she does the the widow pose, and then she ends up drawing it herself, and it's just. Oh man, it's priceless. And she she in my mind guys like when like anyone who has not seen Widow yet and and people are always, you know, I've I talked to a couple people now that are like, "Oh, should I go see it?" I I always tell them this. I'm cuz you never want to spoil it and you never want to set people's expectations up being like, "Oh, it's a really good movie. You want to see it." I always say like, "I'm sorry, but Florence Pugh steals the show." Like when you go to watch it, you're going to, you're going to see how she steals the show. Cause that's not, that's not setting any, anyone's expectations. It's just literally saying like, you need to watch it because this actor is going to take you for a ride. And that's exactly what she does. Exactly. Um, and you know what? Yeah, I'm going to make, I'm going to make one of my crazy ass way far in the future predictions. Like I made with my Dungeons and Dragons thing a couple of weeks ago. Um, I, I bet you any money. And I know you'll agree with me hundred percent, right? Yeah. And like in 15 years or whatever, when Florence Pugh decides, you know what? I've been in twelve Marvel movies. I'm I'm good. I'm I'm stepping away. I'm retiring from playing Yelena. I guarantee you, whatever her last appearance is in the MCU, there's going to be some kind of big emotional moment where we hear the song American Pie, and it's going to make us cry like babies. I, oh, I guarantee easily. you right now. I I really hope they utilize that character as much as possible because she just she just knows how to carry the torch so well. Um, like, don't get me wrong, Scarlet does a great job. Like, you you could tell Scarlet put her all in this movie, um, and and she she definitely helped set the tone for a lot of characters. Like, she definitely did a good job setting the tone for other characters and and didn't hog the spotlight. Um, that being said, Florence just, she was like, she, I, I see why Scarlett was like super happy to work with Florence. Cause like Florence really elevated her performance. Like they both elevated each other's performance and it was really just a joy to watch. Um, and, and, and the other thing is too, is that, so we get the, the Florence thing and the whole red mist and we get, we get the, uh, hint at mind control, which I thought was interesting because, mm -hmm. because this is something Hawkeye suffered from. And, and as always, I always talked about how worried I was about like this movie, like completely being the entirely about the Budapest mission, but to be fair, they didn't, they didn't quite spell it out for you. You kind of had to put it together yourself and like they, they, they gave you all the puzzle pieces. Like they said, like, this is where the Budapest mission happened. And here are the props of the whole thing. Um, and, and they'll, they'll hint at certain things. But to be fair, it's you kind of got to put your you kind of got to put it together yourself, which I like because for I mean, could they have done more? Yes, I think they could have done a little bit more to explain what the significance of the boot pass mission was. But my understanding of it is, is that Widow was mind controlled and Hawkeye saved her. And then, you know, it was them fighting in all that spot, like in that area and then surviving in that area. So that's kind of like the gist of it, but could they have done more? Absolutely. Um, but it was fun to see that 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 kind of Budapest thing get referenced to. The other thing I had kind of a little gripe with is this this guy who can retrieve anything. I can't remember his name, but he was kind of a weird character to introduce in the MCU, in my humble opinion. Oh, like her buddy, the guy who got to see her, her plane. Yeah, the the go to guy, the gopher guy. Yes. Yeah. He sets her up with her new life. Um, he's basically mm -hmm. like the, um, the Mark Forster character from Breaking Bad. He's just like, here, now you live in this trailer in the middle of nowhere. Uh, I'll come by every year and bring you mail. Uh, he, yeah, he was, he was cool. I liked the, the few scenes he had and he had like this fun back and forth with Natasha, but I'm assuming he's new 
to like he's not a, a comic character that they adapted right he's just somebody they made for the movie yeah i think he's yeah. he kind of felt like a decoy kind of promotional character um i mean he was a great character to have and it was nice to see widow kind of have uh, some sort of romantic interest with this guy but again it just kind of felt weird to have him around like i don't know how else to describe it like it just he he he's a very come and go character like that's that's the kind of thing and it and it's it kind of like with a movie like this you kind of don't have the time to waste to just have characters come in and out without any real significance or purpose so so to me it was kind of weird to have that character but what i loved speaking of characters was the introduction and i'm trying to kind of pace with the movie here but the introduction of Taskmaster, no one saw that missile coming. When when Widow got blown from the uh, from the SUV, oh my god, nobody saw that coming. Well, that first shot that we get of Taskmaster, um, and it's just a, a far shot wide uh, of like standing in a room from behind, watching the the huge screen. I'm like, there's no other shot that could have summed up Taskmaster more perfectly than that right there. Absolutely. I mean, like, I love that Taskmaster is watching, watching clips of like the Avengers and the fighting. And like, that's like perfect. Like, that's, mm -hmm. that's exactly what I would expect to introduce character. And the outfit looked fantastic. In my opinion, like, you, I don't think you could have adapted the, the outfit better than that. Like, I like, I like that the Taskmaster didn't have a cape, but still retained the, the cowl or the hood yes. with the, with the mask. And I thought that was so cool. I wish we saw the hood up a little bit more because I kept looking at it back there, like just flopping behind, and I'm like, "Oh, put it on, put it on." It just, just, so much fun. Just, just, <laughs> uh, and and Taskmaster's fight scenes, I just wanted more. Oh my god! Mm. Like at, I was on the edge of my seat the entire time, like just watching Taskmaster uh, do their thing, and I was like, "Oh man, like this is the coolest villain to have in a in a movie," and and. Just to see Taskmaster do the shield throw. And I'm not even spoiling it for you guys at this point because you've seen it in the trailer. Uh, pretty much most of the fight scene we see. But it was really cool to watch. And, uh, like that, The introduction of Taskmaster was great. I, I loved it. Yeah, the intro was great. The fight on the bridge was great. I love, like you said, how it came out of nowhere. And that, that goes back to what I said about how quiet the movie is. Because we just spent mm. like five minutes with Natasha just hanging out in her trailer. She's watching Moonraker because she has amazing taste in movies and she knows it off by Yeah, heart. they dropped the James Bond, yes. which I thought was really cool. Oh, I love that. I love that she's just sitting there and she's she's just melting along with the movie. And I'm like, this is this is such a beautiful little slice of this character that we've never gotten to see. And I'm so happy we've gotten to see it. What I, I think it's so profound, and again, it's so subtle and so quiet. Oh, I love that so much that they they showed us without shoving it down our throats and making it like a weird moral of the movie. They showed us in that one little moment, Natasha's kind of happy, even though she's completely alone in the world. You know, she's not sitting there like gloomy, like I miss the Avengers. She's just like, no, it's cool, man. I got my can of ravioli. I got my Moonraker. I'm fine today. Like she's actually smiling. Like we almost mm -hmm. never see her smile because she's, she's a very sad character. So it was very telling and very sad, but very telling that they show Natasha completely isolated from the rest of like the human race, just living in the woods. And she seems the most at peace that we have ever seen her. That mm -hmm. says so much without saying a word at all, except the dialogue from Moonraker. <laughs> I mean, I, I personally, me, it, it just makes me go like, okay, if I lived the life of a spy, I'd probably watch James Bond too. Just cause like, it's, it's just the, it's just the, it's just the life, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, no, it was, it was a great scene and it was great to see, it was great to see Natasha in her downtime. Cause that's where Marvel thrives is like when you see the characters out of their, out of their superhero personas and just being themselves, it's, it's curious curious to see what they're like when literally they have nothing or nothing to do or or again just being just again watching it uh the same goes for wanda and her obsession with uh with the old 50s sitcoms and like that kind of stuff so yeah it was it was really good to see i but yeah the taskmaster fight scene absolutely loved and then 
What I love too is that when she runs into Florence, I like how you said that she like um, when she runs into Yelena, they kind of Yelena already just kind of resorts back to being the sister like mm-hmm. right away. And the the fight the, the when they first meet up, it's fun to watch. Like it's like it's fun to see how they they do the like how they're so trained. Uh, they're, they're trained to such a point everything's like textbook to them like exactly how to fight and everything yeah um and uh and yeah it was just it was incredible to watch and incredible to watch them get into their groove and and again yeah she really resorts to the sister thing and the dialogue they share to really kind of get to the 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 mental space of the character is so fun like like Yelena talks talks to Widow about like oh you know your story is is like you're waiting for the housing market to go down you're a science teacher like all those little things and it's it's and what I love is when Widow calls calls her out on it and it's just like like look like we weren't a family and you just you see the pain of of Yelena in every single scene where where Natasha challenges the family dynamic and that it's not real and that it's all a lie. And it, and just seeing Yelena's pain is you feel every second of it. Yeah. That was beautiful. Like, again, like the, the, I don't think I knew nothing about Yelena's character going into this, mm-hmm. but I can say with confidence, there is no better way they could have made this character. And yeah, that, that little fight they had when they met the dialogue and it was so cool like i don't have a sibling right like i I never i don't have a brother or sister but i imagine it's like like i love how they handled it in that way where it's like you know where there's two siblings and they'd be fighting or wrestling or whatever and the older one would probably get the upper hand because they would be bigger and they would you know put put the younger one in like a headlock or something and be like just tap out man just tap out shut up i'm gonna call for mom for help and no man just tap out it's like they were doing exactly that but with like Krav Maga (laughs) and it was, it was so perfect. Like that's, again, that's exactly what these two people would do. Uh, Mm -hmm. And it was a great way to introduce adult Elena and also a great way to introduce their relationship and have them kind of catch up because who knows how long it's been since they've seen each other. Yeah, exactly. And, and and that's it, is that there's kind of a blurred timeline between Yelena being freed from mind control and Widow and Widow on the run at that point. So it's kind of like this this kind of up in the air thing. Um so so yeah, and then for me, again, another actor who steals the show is David Harbour. Like as Red Guardian, he really steals the show. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Ryan just got a free um, sweater. Yeah, just got a free sweater. Um, so, so yeah, I read Guardian in this. Uh, David Harbour, I would have loved to have seen him as Ben Grimm, to be honest. Like, I, I really would have. But at the same time, I'm so glad they gave me Red Guardian. Like, he's such a weird character to have in this movie, but he, but he sells it. Like, he sells it, and you just love every scene he's in. He's just so great. The prison scene is is one of my favorite scenes in the entire movie. Like he's bragging, he's bragging about how he fought Captain America, and this one guy just calls him out. He's like, "Yo, he was on ice at that time," and it's just like it's just everyone's like, "Oh my god, I can't believe he said that." I think one of the best lines in the whole movie was he fakes the guy out during the oh yeah, he's just, and that guy thought he was going to beat me. <laughs> I mean, it's it's priceless. Like he's like he's in this prison and he's bragging about his powers and like what he can do and all this stuff. You just see him like crushing. Like yeah, it's it's the little moments that Red Guardian has that like you know with the the, the arm wrestling and the and the thing. But it's the sense of pride he gets from being the Red Guardian that I absolutely love. And even in the beginning of the movie, uh, when they the the plane finally makes it to Cuba and and he talks to uh, the Drakeoff guy. And, uh, and he's like, I want to be like Red Guardian. Like, I want to, you know, do that. And it's, it's interesting that they don't, they don't need him. Like, they just don't want him. And, and they have a super soldier. Like, they literally have Captain America. They have their own Captain America. And they're just like, they're just sidelining this guy. Like, he's not, he's not doing anything. 
<laughs> doing really all this like wonder, he's doing all this Winter Soldier stuff. Like that's essentially what he's doing. And and they they dropped something that I'm like, okay, I need to ask Ryan because Ryan's the expert. Ryan knows. Um, Yelena mistakenly calls him Crimson Dynamo. Yeah, I know from the cartoons is a guy who fights Iron Man, and he's basically what Red Guardian is to Cap, Crimson Dynamo is to Iron Man. He's basically the Russian Iron Man. But is there another version of Crimson Dynamo that is more comic accurate? Like, or is it basically the same? Well, okay. Uh, No, no, no. So, so, so the character we see in Iron Man 2 uh, that Rourke, Rourke plays, Mickey Rourke. Uh Yeah. Um, He is Crimson Dynamo. Like his story, his backstory is like, well, not his look, but his backstory <laughs> and, and, and his involvement with like the Starks and the whole thing, like that's Crimson Dynamo to the letter. And then they just gave him the whiplash look <laughs> and he does the whiplash right. thing. So that's why it was kind of upsetting to see whiplash, like him be portrayed as whiplash. Cause he, they should have just said he was Crimson Dynamo. And, and it would be like if a Batman like, movie had like, a guy in a purple clown costume, but he's like, I'm the penguin and I sell guns. <laughs> exactly. Like it just like, you have a guy that like looks like Joker, acts like Joker. And in the end, he's the penguin as Joker. Yeah. And it's like, it just doesn't make sense. Um, <laughs> and so it's the same thing with Iron Man too, is like, they, they kind of just molded these two characters together, but it's clearly obvious. You could have just made him Crimson Dynamo and just, had you just let comic book fans have their day and that, that would have been awesome. But I see why they tried to dodge it because then it would have just been another villain like Obadiah stained, just making another Iron Man thing. So the young me would have kind of overseen that and been like, no, give me Crimson Dymo. But the older me is like, okay, you would have been playing the same theme, except it's just like the Russians now trying to do what Iron Man did. Um, so, so it's kind of, it's kind of the same thing is like, when she calls him Crimson Dynamo, she's she's just making fun of him. Like she's literally just calling him out. And um, there there has been like two Red Guardians. There's a Red Guardian that doesn't have the serum, and then there's one that does. And and really, the only difference is is one's like a test pilot and fought in World War Two, uh, and the other one's like a more like Cold War Red Guardian. That's the one we got right, the Cold War one. Yeah, we got we got more of the Cold War one, but the weird thing is, is like it's kind of like they kind of just kind of combine the two Red Guardians in a way again, like because like the to be fair, the red the Red Guardian that that David Harbor plays, he actually is Widow's love interest. Ooh, weird. Yeah, right. But I think because like I kind of like the father the fatherly love kind of thing. I, I think that yeah. was a good approach. Um, but yeah, I love I love the prison scene and 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 talking about the pride of the Red Guardian. I love that they give him a toy of himself, and he just like he's so happy, like just this <laughs> genuine happiness. Um, and then the prison breakout scene is so fun, like watching him break out and just you know uh, be the awesome man that David Harbor is. And uh, the the whole the whole scene is so fun, and but it also goes to show you how different. He is to Captain America. One of the things I love seeing in the social media world is a lot of people are comparing him from what they've seen in Black Widow to Captain America. And he's just way more aggressive. Like he's a he's a much more, you know, instead of finding a way around the wall, he just tries to go through it every single time is is the, you know, like it's kind of his approach. Um, and and that's it, it just goes to show you how different the serum is for everybody. Yeah, he's having a great time being a super soldier. He is yeah. like a little kid just given all this power. And he's like, you mean I can punch through walls and they will break? This is amazing. Yeah. Why, <laughs> why did you not give me this power sooner? Uh, and and you, you don't get the sense that he's necessarily a bad guy for thinking that way. Uh, it's cool. It, it's not like like Venom where, you know, Eddie Brock gets these Spider-Man powers and all of a sudden he's like, yes, now I can kill and eat brains. This guy's just like, Oh wow. Now I can be strongest guy in the room and I can, I can beat some people up and have fun. Eh? People will know me and buy my action figure toys. That 
that says so much about this guy and it makes him very unique in the MCU. There's not a whole lot of folks like him rattling around. So I really appreciate the kind of guy Red Guardian ended up being. Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny because Red Guardian, even as a character, was used for propaganda purposes. Like, he was just like, you know, just again, the like Russia's answer to Captain America. Um, but really, you know, it's funny because then you have then you have Bucky who was who was put into the the Russian program and he was given the soldier super soldier serum as well, right? And yet they used him more because it was a, they they had a different strategy with him. But uh, but yeah, and and you just see him reliving these glory days and uh, and you know. I, I have to agree with Isabella. Like it was kind of kind of cheesy that the avalanche, like it was just like seconds away from him, like getting swept by the avalanche and the whole nine yards. They pulled him out. Like you could have just pulled him out seconds earlier, and then the whole thing gets swept under. Like I don't think it needed to be that close in order to make it feel like it was that close. It's tension, man. It's tension. I tension was there. The tension was easily the second. The second Yelena did being being the boss that she was, which again I loved her reaction to conflict. Uh, like this, uh, this tower is trying to shoot down the copter, and she's like, "Okay, you know what? Had enough of this." And like gets a rocket launcher and just like boom, blows up the tower. And she's like, "Ha, yeah!" And then sits down in her chopper. And then she looks and sees the avalanche happening. Like again. That you have to understand from a filmish perspective, like for her, she had to play out that whole scene, like sitting down, looking out like, all right, I did it. And then have this moment like, oh, my God, wait, I just caused an avalanche. And then you see like they are like scrambling to get this whole scrambling to save Red Guardian in order to find out where this uh, Leviathan group is or, well, I guess the Red Room group. Um, but uh, yeah, like it's it's a fun it's a fun experience. To be fair, an avalanche is a pretty cool way to die. I don't know why that's fair at all. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know, Red Guardian would have had the same thing happened, you know, had to him that happened to Captain America. He would have been submerged under ice. Mm. And you know, he woke up years later. <laughs> he wakes up in 2099 and Spider-Man 2099 is there and he's like, "Hey man, it's... I don't know why I'm doing this. I'm not shooting a web. That's just to physically inform me that I'm Spider-Man. This is a podcast, <laughs> but I'm making I'm making web fingers for the four people who decided to watch this visually. I'm Spider-Man 2099, <laughs> man. Like, what am I doing in the future? Does Captain America still remember me? <laughs> but that's the other thing too. I love that he is like so hell bent on like. Like, you know, like, like the, the first thing he asks when she land, when they land the copter, uh, is like, uh, is like, so does like Captain America talk about me? Like, cause like he wouldn't have known, he, Cap wouldn't have known he didn't, he, didn't, he would have existed. <laughs> like, it's so priceless. Like, it's so funny. Um, then we get to going, being reintroduced to Rachel Wise's character, which is a scary character. She is yeah, a man. scary character. She's got like, again, the, the choices they made for these people are so different than anything we've seen before. And with her, again, a, a character I don't know anything about. And they drop her on us. And you know, we only have seen her as this warm, loving mother who, you know, protected her two kids as far as we knew, you know, flew this plane, whatever. We're like, OK, she's this this cool lady. She loves her kids. Blah, blah, blah. She seems like a totally normal person. And then we see her and she's totally not a normal person. She's got this weird detachment to the rest of the world where she's like, yes, I'm, I'm making this thing where I can mind control pigs and then eventually people. And yeah, I'm, I almost killed that pig, but it's not a big deal. Like, that's just what I do. Like, she's completely cold and analytical. She's like Spock, but somehow more heartless and, and less caring. And it created this, you're right, really creepy lady who, even though she was on the side of the heroes in this movie, I I don't know how far I would trust her because she's done some sketchy things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's done some sketchy things. Um, and again, like they once they 
I, I when I saw the trailer about the family scene, you know, in the in the the, the living room, and the and she's like, okay, you know, everyone knock it off, and you know, uh, Elena's like, oh, well, I, you know, I didn't do anything. That's not fair. I was like, <laughs> oh man, this is gonna be so cheesy. Like this family thing is not gonna fly. But once you get the context, it works so well. The family dynamic works mm-hmm. really well. And my this is this is the kind of scene where the emotions peak to such a point that um that again going back to where where florence steals the show like this you see it building up that she just just hates the fact that natasha doesn't see the family that she has and just like is like what like like there's a shot just before she walks away from the table and you just feel the pain oh my god do you feel the pain she she has the perfect mixture again of that little girl mixed with this this adult this badass adult uh who you know she stormed away from the table and went to go sulk in her room but she took that big old bottle of vodka with her uh uh, the the two worlds are colliding uh i loved that whole dinner table scene um, my mm-hmm. my favorite part of that scene was when they panned the camera over and Vin Diesel was at the other end and he's like, "Family is the most important." Yeah. Dude in the world. <laughs> I mean, it was, but it, I mean, Yelena. Uh, oh my God, Melina, Melina. I think her name is. Um, I think yeah, Melina or Marina, something, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah, she uh, she brings in the pig and talks about like like the control the red room has over you, and to the point where the you know, you tell the pig to stop breathing and they're like, that's insane. Like that is just, Oh my God, that was such an intense scene. Um, but yeah, that living room scene, I was really worried at first from the trailer. I'm like, Oh man, it's going to be kind of like cringy. But once you get all the context and you understand what the structure is, it's, it's such a good scene. Uh, then we get the, then we get the, the red room coming to get them. And I love again the Red Guardian. David Harbour steals the show once again with the comedy. He's he plays the role of comedic relief, um, but he does it in such a genuine way to the point where he's just like he's gonna try and stop them. And he takes like one trank dart, and he's like, "That's it. Dude, that's nothing to me." And they just shoot him like twenty more times. <laughs> so good. every time I thought they were gonna stop shooting, another dart <laughs> appeared on his chest, and I love that. <laughs> Like, oh man there's gotta be yeah. end, right there's gotta be there's no more darts after this oh there's more darts <laughs> well played the timing of that whole moment was just perfect oh man and he got hit like a good 20 30 times like <laughs> they, they took him down for sure um so so yeah i was kind of hoping to see in terms of the lore of marvel i was hoping to see the red room kind of expanded to like leviathan and, and get into the whole uh kind of the the hydra of russia if you will but I guess they kind of wanted to keep it simple. I, I think this movie had a very clear objective and they didn't want to expand on too much. They they literally only expanded on, I think they really expanded on uh, Yelena as a character because uh, obviously there, there's got to be a lot more to do with her. And they also expanded on the Red Room because of the, the backstory it offers, Widow and, and all that. So I really think that they they just kept it very contained. Um, and that, which brings me to the whole red room experience because, you know, um, I, the movie still ends up surprising you a little bit in terms of the story and, and, and what they, what they do with, uh, how widow essentially gets to Drake off. Um, but I think one of the stories is, is like, you kind of learn that, uh, you, you learn that Widow assassinates Drakov's daughter, which is a beautiful play on this her backstory, which we learn about in the first Avengers movie. But at the same time, I still feel like they didn't they didn't tell you enough of what exactly happened and how it exactly impacted her. You mean in this movie? They didn't tell you enough? Yeah, I, I don't think they did. I personally don't. I don't feel like they did because they show the explosion. They show that she essentially killed a, a innocent little girl, mm-hmm. um, and it totally warps her. And I get that. I get yeah. that. Um, what I don't get is like she was mind controlled as a widow to do it. Barton freed her in some way. I guess. I guess Barton freed her, uh, and then I, I just yeah I just. 
all this all of a sudden out of nowhere widow gets caught up with like i need to know who my real mother is and all of a sudden like to me, all of a sudden that happens, and then all of a sudden she's like, "Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna kill Drake off properly because I didn't I wasn't able to do it before." Right. Um, I, I don't know. I feel like everything with Drakov's daughter, mm-hmm. uh, which we now know is all that red that was redding up her ledger. The gushing red in her ledger, the yeah. Gushing red. <laughs> um, that that to me, it felt like I. I don't know. I felt like I got enough of that part of the story. Like I, I know that she wanted revenge because Drakov is a big old jerk. Mm-hmm. So it made sense. She's like, I need to take this guy down, but he's not easy to take down. So we kind of had to use his daughter to figure out where he was going to be in a certain spot. And of course, now we know they flubbed that mission was a failure, but I think it was a cool idea that they basically gave her the same scene from Scarface where Tony Montana is told, go kill that guy, go blow up his car. And then Tony sees the guy has his kid in his car. And he's like, no, man, I'm not doing that shit. I'm not killing a kid. I don't need that in my life. And he turns his back on that. And I think it's really interesting that Natasha had, you know, she made the other choice. She's like, I'm never going to get another chance. Click. And she let that bomb go off, even though we could see on her face, like she was not happy that she had to do that. Uh, so I, I liked that even though we didn't get a lot, it told us, it, it, it told us very little of that mission, Mm -hmm. but it told us pages about her and about how desperate she was at that point Mm -hmm. to have to do that. Uh, and, and then of course it ends up paying off even later. I I think it does. And, and we'll get, we'll get into that because I I agree with you. And I think, I think that's what I keep forgetting is I keep kind of want to looking at what does it do to the world? Or as opposed to you, you got to remember it's like what is it doing to Widow? Like that's mm-hmm. that's what it comes back to is what is it doing to Widow? And that's why I kind of want to see more of the world that that she was affected by. But I, I agree with you is is all and and it goes back to the genius of of Avengers one when she fights the Hulk. It's it's a great scene, but it what it's what it does to Widow that makes it such a great scene. Like the yeah. fear. The the holding herself like like this the the scene where they're like oh we spotted Barton and she's like she's just like shaking and like trying to collect herself like yeah I think that's I think you're right I think that's the kind of the genius of it all and and yeah they kind of but I do kind of feel like they leave it up to your imagination to kind of connect the dots like they'll give you enough to go with but I still feel like it's up to you to kind of connect more of the dots and 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 find some other pieces that you need but. You're right. Yeah, I'll give you that. But okay, so let's talk about let's talk about the big reveal. All right, this is what people came for. So Taskmaster. Okay, everyone's expectations of this is is as a comic book fan going into this is like Taskmaster could be the next Loki if you do it right. Like if you do a Taskmaster right, then you can have Taskmaster in here and you can have you know that character come in so many different scenes and the character physicality wise to some incredible stuff like the the hawkeye bow and arrow thing bouncing off the, the road blowing up the car and the sword the the black panther fighting it's all there guys like the, 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 it's all there comic book fans it's all there it looks visually stunning they did a great job with taskmaster so this is the the biggest controversy with black widow right now i've why i've watched twitter unfold after the after the movie and it was really, really rough on Taskmaster. Everyone's saying oh, the movie's no. yeah. Everyone's saying the movie's great. Love, I love the movie. But what they did to Taskmaster is the same thing they did with Iron Man three. That's what everyone's feeling like. I disagree. That is a harsh piece of judgment. That- it is. It is. It it really is. And I think it goes back to the the premise is that is it's the expectation is, is that this character, which in my opinion, in my humblest of opinions, this is a generational character. The way they set it up in the MCU, if 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 the Red Room created this as a project, then they could have easily done made it a program, and you can have five taskmasters if you wanted to like based on what they were able to do so in my mind 
I I loved seeing Taskmaster. I want to see more. The reveal to me is weird. It's just weird. I can't I have nothing against the the actor. She was great. I love her. She was in James Bond. All right, you know, she's she's got a great background, but it was a we, like it just felt like a like a, a like a, a very confused reveal is kind of I guess the best way to describe it. A lot of people are feeling like an Iron Man 3, like the whole Mandarin kind of reveal thing. It's kind of like kind of people are kind of really upset. And it's because like if you look at the comparisons of, of Taskmaster throughout the media, uh, the animated series, uh, gate video games, all this stuff, they all seem to really be drawn to that kind of Taskmaster and they did not get it. So it sounds like it was a matter again of expectation versus reality. And but this is this is this is where I this is where I still think that I'm I'm very and this is where I still think I am happy with the Taskmaster I got in terms of physicality, visual experience, the character itself. Um, and you, I think that's the problem is you got to remember is they're not trying to expand a story. They're trying to tell and finish a story. This is not one that's going to build and set like. Like in my mind, Sang Chi, Eternals, those are world building movies. Those their job is going to expand the world while focusing on a character. Widow's world is is tying up and being finished. So we may get more Yelena as a widow, but in terms of like building the world of Black Widow, it's they're just saying like, here's a vacation in the world of Widow. We hope you enjoyed your stay, you know, and that's it. I don't I don't think that I think that they this was a very careful choice because if they built out Taskmaster, that would mean that the whole widow story needs to continue on in a certain way, shape, or form. Right. They're not trying to create this huge rivalry between these two. It it had to be something different. I I went through a lot of ebbs and flows with Taskmaster. Because you know, I was going to say I need to know because you seem you seem pretty shocked that people are feeling this way. I am like I so during those opening credits, which like I said, I loved. Mm -hmm. um, I saw Olga Kurilenko's name come up in the credits, and I didn't remember seeing her name in any of the press stuff beforehand. So I was like, "Oh, cool! Olga Kurilenko's in this. Awesome!" And like you said, she's she's a, a Bond lady. She is one of my favorite Bond ladies. In fact, she's Camille from Quantum of Solace. I'm like, yes, give me some more Camille. Uh, and then the movie's going on and I'm getting swept up in the movie. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not thinking about Olga Kurilenko anymore. She almost kind of faded from my mind because I'm busy spending time with Natasha and Yelena. And then Taskmaster shows up and we see that scene where that widow comes and puts that, that USB in the, in the back of uh, his head. And I'm like, oh, is he a robot? That's dumb. I don't, I don't like this anymore. But then you could hear breathing coming from inside the suit. And that immediately kind of quenched my fears. And I'm like, okay, there's somebody in there. Good. Uh, I, I'm, I'm done with robots. I'm adding them. I'm officially adding them to zombies in the list of things that I don't need to see in films again. That's it. We're, right. we're done. We can move on. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I just carried on with this ride of Taskmaster. And, you know, I know, I think in the comics, he's a mutant which is where why he has this sort of singular power from birth. So I'm like, okay, I don't know what they'll do with him, but I'm along for the ride. And then when that flashback scene happened and we saw her blow up Dracov's daughter, as soon as that scene happened, I was like, I think that might be Taskmaster. Um, and sure enough, when we get to the reveal, because it's like there's nobody else left for it to be. Uh, yeah. So it, like, it wasn't like I was like, I'm a smarty pants. I figured it out. It's like, I think that's the only person left who can be behind that mask. Cause I have, I've seen everybody else in the same room with him at this point. So the mask comes off. Um, and she's like, I would have gotten away with it too. If it wasn't for you meddling widows. Uh, and they, and then it's Olga Kurilenko and I'm like, Oh shit, I forgot. And I got really excited at that point. And she was so intense without saying a word, just had this like dead stare um, and again, to bring it back to the mutants, you know, she reminded me of with the way her face and like how her eyes were all messed up. She reminded me of 
um, Mutant 143 from X-Men 2. The weird guy who like yes, tortures yeah. Professor X. Uh, and I I wasn't sure what they were going to do with it. And then when when she's skydiving after Widow, I'm like, that is so cool. She She cannot stop punching her. This is fantastic. I thought we were done with Taskmaster, but she's coming again for more. And now we we get to this end point and all the widows are fine. The gas has been spread. Their their brain damage has been erased. And it looks like, I don't know how banged up she is, but it looks like she's going to be okay. She just, you know, she's got some some rehab to go through. Mm-hmm. But I I I guarantee we have not seen the last of Taskmaster. We're going to get her back. And what state she's in is going to be really, like, I'm curious to see what that is, especially if they decide to make her a mutant, because this movie really doesn't give us any concrete reason as to why she's so good at mimicry. They're just like, you know, it's, it's not like Drakov was training his daughter to be a widow. So it's it's not like she was part of this program um, like from the get go. So I wouldn't be surprised, Ryan, if when the mutants start showing up, she's like, yeah, me too. I'm I'm one of them. Uh, uh, I don't know, man. I I think I think at this point, and and I, I don't get me wrong. I'm enjoying this 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 difference of views here. Um, because my understanding was it was the chip in the back of the neck that allows her to have photogenic like reflexes. Um, oh. so I remember because I remember him saying is like, oh yes, she'd like, uh, my daughter was practically you know blown to bits. And like, you know, I had to like put a chip in the back of her neck, but it gives her photogenic like reflexes, which to me, um, to be honest, yes, I would love to see the Taskmaster from the the animated, like the comics and the, the whole thing. But I also know that Taskmaster, Taskmaster from the comics also sold a program that allows people to be as closely to him as possible. So could they, if Marvel really wanted to, they can recover if they feel that this, this, this Taskmaster was not exactly how they wanted to deliver it. Um, but um, yeah, not exactly how they wanted to deliver it, but they, they could fix it. They, they easily can fix the, there's enough plot. There's enough plot surrounding Taskmaster where you can easily play with it and just create a whole new persona and have the real taskmaster come out i agree with you that like it made sense to do it um but again i i do want to see i just need more of task i there's some things in this film i guess which the film does well enough to to play out which is like i need to see more i need to see i need to understand a bit more from the world of widow um especially around taskmaster because again i was really excited but also the other reason I was, I was asking myself, but again, you know, now that I look back, I can kind of get it. Like why make Taskmaster, you know, look like a, like a more male, like broad character. Right. It's like, cause like, yeah, once the, the helmet comes off, you kind of see that her head doesn't quite fit her body. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if she's like more or less a cyborg or like an Android, if you will, that like he preserved his daughter that way maybe he might have had to piece her together. I mean, that was a, a full on bomb. Um, so who knows how much of her is left, but uh, yeah, who knows? Maybe they'll pull a Mandarin with it. Uh, mm-hmm. Like I, frankly, I don't find this as big of a, like, I don't find this a letdown at all. Not like how, you know, Ben Kingsley Mandarin ended up being, uh, and then it's just like, I'm a guy with a tattoo. <laughs> Look at me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this, this to me, like I, I feel personally, I feel satisfied. I feel like I got Taskmaster in a movie. Uh, I, I think I could have stood to see a much more of a, like a visual representation of those powers of the fact that she can mimic everything. Cause I feel like, yeah, we got some things that were subtle, like the black Panther thing and throwing the shield. Mm-hmm. But I guess I was always picturing like a fight where it's, it's like no matter what widow does taskmaster does the exact same thing first, like slightly faster. I don't know. It's a difficult power to show on film. So I, I don't begrudge yeah. them at all for having, you know, if, if it wasn't put to film mm-hmm. exquisitely, but I think we could have gotten more, they could have shown us that rather than just have Ray Winstone say that that's what she can do. 
Yeah, I, well, so we do get, you're right though, we do get a small preview of how it works, not only through like black doing the Black Panther movement, the Captain America, the Hawkeye, um, but when you when Taskmaster first, first fights Widow, we see through Taskmaster's eyes and you see like the, the, the stats and the data, which I thought was really cool. Mm -hmm. And then the best way they demonstrate how the photogenic reflexes work is Widow does her famous you know luchadori flip and knocks taskmaster on the ground but then taskmaster does the exact same thing to her right after and it's like it's that instant kind of acknowledgement but i think what i i think what we're seeing with taskmaster as a character is you, yes you could do a lot more with this character and i think you should i think we need to see taskmaster in other movies as a villain or even as a as another kind of right hand henchman, you know, interrupting like kind of like a mini boss, like a mini boss interrupting, yeah. you know, Yelena next, like she runs into Yelena and realizes like, Oh, you know, whatever. Or, you know, or another, like, like Hydra, Hy like takes on Taskmaster and takes control of Taskmaster. Yeah. And I think such is the nature of Taskmaster, right? Like he's sort of the character that can kind of, you know, Taskmaster can fight, spider-man and black widow and deadpool like it, you can kind of shove this character anywhere and it doesn't feel out of place yeah like, it, it's not like green goblin where it's like hey why is green goblin fighting the hulk those two don't have any beef like mm -hmm. taskmaster can kind of go into any pocket and and uh fit in there so you're right we'll see her again and we'll see like different mm -hmm. uh, different ways she can do what she does. But I I do like how villainous Drakeoff was. Like I'm, I'm so sorry if I'm totally butchering that name, but that that guy was like a terrible human being. Like he was just absolutely an abusive, terrible human being. And that was a great villain scene. Like, and the fact of the matter is, is like he doesn't even fight. Like he does not fight. He barely fights it in this movie, but what he does to you emotional, like the emotional abuse he does to widow. Just insane. Yeah. He got, uh, if you ask me, he got off too lightly dying in an explosion. Uh, yeah. He now, is it just me or like, were the, did, did Ray Winstone have like full on makeup and bodysuit in this movie, or is he actually just like an old plus sized man now? Because I, I know it's been a long time since the Punisher mm -hmm. movie, but I always picture in my head Ray Winstone as like a big, fit, younger guy. Like, when did he become a little old man? Is this, I, am I, am I yeah, just I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, he seemed like he was a different build in this this movie, but like, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I think, if I'm not mistaken, his name is credited as. Oh no, it's just it's just Drake off. Okay, because at first it was like Major something or other, and like apparently in the comics, like he's a mutant. He could turn into a bear. <laughs> wow. Yeah, he turns into he turns into a massive bear. So I thought I thought that at one point we may see that, and I thought that would, that would like when he when he told Taskmaster to leave the room, and and she's like, "Oh, are you sure you're gonna be okay with that?" I'm like, "Oh man, he's gonna turn into a bear!" <laughs> like getting so excited, and I was like, "Oh wait, no, that's not gonna happen." Um, yeah. So so it's it's but yeah, going back to Taskmaster, though, it's it's weird. It's a weird character. I think maybe I, I'm actually starting to lean on the side of maybe it's a cyborg because like. Maybe like she barely survived and like he had to like essentially, you know, build her out the way she was. But I don't know. I in the end, I need to see more of Taskmaster. I need to learn more about Taskmaster and and see how how this Taskmaster is going to fit in the MCU world a bit more. Um, do we need that? Probably not. I mean, like I said, this story closes its closes the book pretty pretty well. And and Yelena seems to be the only seems to be the only character that's going to carry on uh, for good reason. We'll we'll explain that in a few minutes. But but it seems to me like the widow world is like okay, done. Like that's we got it. It's good. You know, uh, uh, Scar Scarjo told her story that she wanted to tell the widow. We got to see the red room. We got to see more of the red room. We got to see 
Red Guardian. We got to see some great comic book characters. But in the end, it's like, okay, that chapter's done. Yes. And there's only one thing that would, for me, make it interesting enough to warrant further diving into the, the Widow world. And it might not even be a thing that really exists, Ryan. It might be entirely an assumption I'm making in my head. So I need you to use your expertise to tell me if this is real or if I'm just a, being a big old dummy. But okay, mm-hmm. this this program in the Red Room is called the Widow Program, right? Where all these yes. all these all these agents are called widows. Uh, so she she leaves the program and she just takes on this new persona as the Black Widow uh, and becomes an Avenger eventually. Um, does and if the answer is yes, this is going to make me really excited. Does every widow have a different color code name? Like, is there a purple widow and a green widow? Is that a real thing, or is she just special? The, the black widow is like a, is like the title. Like, if you, you're like the, the the top, you're the top one that represents their group. Okay, so, so for example, like Yelena, Yelena was was next in line to be the black widow okay until she got the mist and then she's like oh to hell with this and she, she well the mist i think the mist thing was more more actually a uh mcu thing than it was a comic book thing it was it was that it was just that you were raised in this program and that's all you knew and that's it like um it's kind of just like they just kind of take you from the world and you're you're just so you're just so uh what's the word i guess you're you're so conditioned to be a widow that that's all you know so that's all you who you are and and so that's why that's why you're kind of getting that story and i think the the mist was just kind of a good way to again i i just feel like this movie just really kept things very concise and tried to avoid expanding and expanding and expanding because if you look at the comics widows the red room program was a part of the leviathan group the leviathan group was the russian version of hydra and what they're what they were and what they excelled at was they essentially were like the black market of superhero stuff so they had the widow program to which they would sell people widows in order to do whatever they wanted to do and like be the ultimate assassins and essentially you can hire a widow or own a widow of your own and go do whatever thing you wanted to do. Um, same goes for uh, red guardian and, and, you know, and also winter soldier, like these, these things were all part of the Leviathan group. And so that's kind of the mentality of them is that they create these programs and they sell it to the highest bidder in the black market. Gotcha. But it wasn't but, like, so, a, like a reservoir dogs thing where it's like, and this one is purple widow and this one is brown no, widow. No, no. Each it's one just, has different specialties and things. And yeah, it's, it's just plain. Old. Okay. Cause I, there were rumors a few months ago before the movie came out that going forward, Yelena's character would be the white widow. Is that all just BS? I, it's it's just it's it's they're just widows like that's that's okay. it like black widow is the famous one but they're all they're all essentially black widows like and and it's just but that's that's what i'm saying is like like natasha was the best of them and 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 yelena was the second best hmm. i see hmm. interesting all right yeah. so but but that's but in the end like the 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 whole red room crashing and the red room being in the sky I thought was really cool it's kind of like a nice nod to the anti shield mm-hmm. and uh, and yeah the 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 parachute scene was kind of cool I guess it was it was it was it was fun to watch uh, but in my mind they just really tried to wrap up this story and just they they left nothing to, to world building. Which is kind of weird, and this is the other side of the coin that makes it weird, is because this is the first movie to kick off Phase Four, and yet it's like such a closed book. You know, it's it's an epilogue to an Infinity Saga, which is essentially what Far From Home was supposed to be as well. Yes, you're now that you bring that up. That's right. It's it's like this makes a better Phase Three epilogue than Far From Home did. Far From Home suits a Phase Four's beginning. And this yes. suits more of a phase three is ending. You're right. That's, I wonder if there was ever a point super early on where they were supposed to be switched. 
Maybe. maybe it's it's definitely seems like that could have been the case but you're, yeah i mean i think you definitely said it best is and that's and i think that's why in the end guys don't get me wrong i'm like fellow listeners i i gotta stop saying guys in the end fellow listeners um that's what that's why i okay in the end i still love this movie i still think it's like the classic marvel experience it does a great job but like the first Iron Man, they don't focus on world building too much. They focus on the character and what the world is doing to the character. And that's what you have to remember. Uh, unlike movies like, you know, uh, Captain America Winter Soldier, that was a world building movie. Like that, like they, they brought back Hydra. They, they reintroduced Hydra and how bad they are and how they've been influencing the whole system and and then it opens up Bucky and what the Russians did. Like there's so many things that influence everything. Where Widow, it's again, the story is all about how these events influence the character. And through that, the torch is passed to another character and then that's it. So that's why I think, you know, expectation wise is people are going to go into this being like, man, we're going to, you know, learn that widow is still alive because Kang she's now in the world of quantum mania. And like, that's not going to happen with this movie. It's just not, mm. it's not, you're not going to get that with this movie. In fact, that's why I'm saying like Sung Chi will probably be the, the world building movie you're looking for that will kick off phase four because that's in, and same with Eternals because that's what those movies are going to be designed to do. Exactly. And I'm glad it worked out that way. Like about an hour and a half into the Black Widow, I was like, I'm, I'm sitting there thinking like, God, I hope Iron Man doesn't show up. Like at this point, yeah. I don't want any of that. I, I'm having so much fun with this story. Yeah. And again, it's, it's, I keep going back to this word because I loved this about the movie is it, how quiet it is uh, to the point where adding in all of that would be unnecessary noise. This is the kind of movie that, you know, it's not the ending of Spider-Man swinging into the camera with an American flag behind him. This is the kind of movie where the last shot is just a slow pan up to some trees with some fireflies in front of them. And then it just cuts the black. And that is perfect for this movie. And it's not the norm, but I loved that. And I, mm -hmm. I'm so glad that they didn't try to make this like, and also Mephisto is here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because we, we are we are in this pocket of this world that's yeah. it's not blue aliens and, and demons and, and Nicolas Cage riding a motorcycle or whatever. It's just a bunch of Russians having a good old time betraying each other and breaking their mm. own noses. And that is exactly all I needed. And I'm so happy that it is the way it is. Absolutely, hundred um, percent. And and if you want a world building experience, that's why Loki is top movie right now, or top Disney Plus series, because that's that's a world building movie. Like they, what they've done is they've completely introduced a whole new side of the Marvel world that 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 will affect a lot of characters. But in the end, it's it's how how Loki's story will lead up to building like this thing that's gonna in the end influence a lot of characters. Where Widow, it's it's about Widow's history and Widow's life. It's not mm -hmm. about it's not about Marvel's Marvel MCU. It's about Widow, and and that's why it's a classic Marvel feel for me. That reminds me of the original Iron Man movie because it's it's just it's this this character goes on a ride, and and I will say the performances in this are everyone is just amazing. In my mind, though, if I had to pick one performance the, that stands out above the rest is is Florence Pugh as Elena because watching her every scene, I'm just I loved every second of of what she did, every choice she made, every reaction she had. It was just so much fun. Florence Pugh absolutely crushed this role, mm -hmm. um, but I, I want to bring something up. Having said that, you're the first person that I have talked to about the movie because I only just watched it last night and I haven't seen anybody since. But I really hope, Ryan, I really hope that when I start talking to people, they all kind of are on the same train of thought because we have had almost since the beginning of the MCU, we've had Black Widow in the mix. She came in in the third movie and she's been with us ever since. And Scarlett Johansson has been just solid all throughout every time we've seen her. 
And she has gone on record saying after this movie, she's hanging up the cape. She's hanging up the tights. Uh, she's, she's content. She's leaving the MCU. And I, I think, uh, and I, I, I'm getting a little emotional just to just kind of bring it up here, but I think she saved the best for last in terms of just what she brought to the table and what uh, this character brought to the table. And I think to all those kids that we keep talking about who grew up alongside these movies and, you know, a lot of those kids, you know, they're idolizing these heroes. Black Widow was one of these heroes. And now she is moving on. And I can only imagine what that must be like for somebody who grew up idolizing this lady and thinking like, I want to be just like her. I want to be like a hero like her. She's so cool. And I think we got to give super mad props right now to Scar Jo for everything that she has brought to this character. What a cool, like she could have been in a world full of super soldiers and Norse gods and hulks. She could have been lost in the shuffle as just a regular human with some batons. Yeah. And and she could have been super lame. And I think as much as, you know, Hawkeye's a cool dude, but he can be kind of lame sometimes. And it's like, I don't really care unless his wife's around. I don't really care <laughs> what Hawkeye's up to. But Black Widow, I never felt that way. I never felt like, oh man, there's all these cool aliens and stuff and we got to hang out with a normal human. I never felt that once with Black Widow. And I think mm -hmm. we owe that to what Scarlett Johansson brought to this person. So I, I definitely would say she saved the best for last in terms of um, the performance. And, and I am so sad to see her go, but I am so grateful for all the years she has given us of this amazing hero. So thank you, Ms. Johansson. I know you're listening. You're our only Patreon, Scarlett. Thank you for that. So, <laughs> if you guys want to be like Scarlett, join our Patreon. There you go, right? <laughs> or like James Gunn. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's I, I, I don't want to cheapen all the the wonderful things you said because, like, again, like, like ScarJo did so much for this character, and and she stole a lot of the show. Like, she, she, like, in terms of the overarching MCU, like, there, there are scenes where she just crushes it. Mm -hmm. Um. And the the crazy thing about it is, is like you look at Iron Man 2, start with Iron Man 2, then I would say jump to jump to Infinity War and then jump to Infinity War and Endgame and then go to Widow and look at the different performances throughout. Like if you just go through the entire MCU and just watch Widow's performances, I'd say the beginning, middle, and end all come into um, Iron Man 2, uh, the Infinity War and Endgame, and then Widow. And you will see such a drastic change of performance. I think the Russos really kind of understood how Widow was going to fit into the MCU world. I liked the Iron. I think the Iron Man two performance was a fun aspect, but I feel like it did not define her character. I think she, again, she she was a smaller character in that that movie, but she definitely had a story that was worth telling, and and we definitely got it with Widow, and it was a great way to show the life she left behind with that character, and uh, just just awesome, just awesome. It's it's so cool to have that hindsight now and you're right to look back like she she is the quietest avenger she's always doing something it's just always much more subtle you know everybody is running around punching things or or what or like yelling or whatever and then she's just making a peanut butter sandwich but her face says everything yeah I, it's i this made me appreciate her even more than i already yeah. have and now i can't wait to do exactly what you just said is go back and watch how how much she's doing without even having to say a word and and yeah like even endgame like one of the i remember one of the one of my favorite posts about widow is is simply one of the posts that they did about widow was simply the fact that like in endgame she was the one to lead the the, the avengers that were left she she did it she she led them no one mm -hmm. else was gonna do it cap didn't do it you know, like uh, Hawkeye obviously didn't do it. Captain Marvel didn't even do it. Captain no, freaking Marvel. Off. She, she cut her off. hair and she took off. 
War Machine didn't even do it. A widow did it. She led a, a, a superhero group. Someone who has no powers and commanded a group. She commanded Rocket. <laughs> that is insane. And, and on top I of mean, all that, she knows Moonraker off by heart. And on top, exactly, exactly. Like the thing she did in the MCU as a character, just like unreal. She fooled Loki. She, you know, man, like you could go on and on, like just on and on. I can't wait to, to like talk to some people who, who grew up, like some kids who grew up with these movies and see what they think. Cause I, I'd love to get their take on it. Uh, but yeah, Scarlet man, you rock. Uh, this is a, a retirement well-earned Miss Johansson. So thank That's you it. for everything. Now, we we figured, Ryan, that a certain purple-haired somebody was going to be yes. putting together a certain crew. Uh, yeah. Were you shocked to see her pop up, or did you figure like she's? Coming? I knew it was. I knew it was coming because of the rumors and and that she was supposed to be introduced in Black Widow uh, first, and then we were supposed to get. It. I thought she'd have more of a scene in some like again. This is I don't know. Maybe again. I think I fell in the trap of expectations of this movie. Um, a little bit, but uh, I mean, it makes sense. She has this, she has this kind of cameo pattern thing going on, but I love seeing her. I loved seeing her come in and do her thing. You know, it was, it was great to watch. I loved it. Um, and it seems like everyone everyone's definitely going this way now. Is that she's she's forming the Dark Avengers? Is essentially what, what they're calling it. She's forming the Dark Avengers, and she is the anti Coulson. <laughs> she's that but that's it like it, like because she's she's now got she's now got u.s agent and actually someone also brought up a good point was the dark avengers that have been recruited right now all have to do a death um so she has recruited u.s agent and battlestar died and that person now is a vendetta against the avengers because you know yeah, uh, because of what the what the Avengers have done to U.S. Agent through having Battlestar getting killed by superhuman people, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then you also now have you, you also have uh, Yelena or Yelena, I think it is, um, who is now who who uh, Widow has died, and now she's being told it's because of an Avenger. So I'm pretty sure this is not like this is. Uh, we're going to see like, again, we're going to, and I think it'd be interesting, you know, as opposed to, cause like the biggest question right now that everyone's asking is what will the next Avengers movie be like? And I think, you know, again, like you, this is not an easy feat. Like you have to do like secret wars. You have to do something. It'd be kind of cool to do like a villain Avengers movie. I've been wishing and praying, man. I want a team on team battle. That's not yeah. civil war where we know they're still going to have dinner and drinks later because they're still friends. Like I want, and and no more, you know, armies of faceless robots and aliens. Give me a team who matches the Avengers person to person, and let me see what happens when they go at it. Like that is what I've been itching for since I think Age of Ultron. And I can't wait for I can't wait for Elaine to just put this team together already. <laughs> like, I, I I don't know how many more movies she's going to show up in before she has her full team of people. Yeah. Um, maybe we'll see her in Shang Chi. I don't know, but I think we will because she will probably recruit uh, Abomination. Oh my god! So like she's she's on her way. She's getting that team. Uh, maybe she's uh, pulling some strings with whoever Sharon Carter was talking to on the phone. Maybe that's Kingpin, please. But like we're 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 moving in that direction, and I could not be happier with it. Yeah, couldn't agree more, man. It's gonna be good. It's gonna be good. Uh, but in the end, guys, I, I loved Widow. I think it's it's an incredible addition to the MCU world, and it just it tells you the Black Widow story that you need. That's that's the best way to describe it. Yes, yes, it does. Now, Ryan, I know it's still fresh. It's still fresh film. But yeah. if we had to do our Infinity Stone, Stone ratings, 
which we do because it's a yeah. rule here, uh, which is do we give it zero stones or one, two, three, four, five, six, or maybe even a whole gauntlet? What are we given Black Widow right I'm now? Gonna be, I'm going to be honest, and I'm going to say five stones. Five stones. All five right. Stones. Let me put this down. Five stones. Okay. What what would you have liked to see to push it up to a full gauntlet? I I do feel for the Taskmaster fans. I really do. I really, really, really do. And I I feel like you could have you could have involved the Taskmaster we know and loved in a in a certain way to make the story a little more give it a little more oomph. Um that would have definitely elevated it for me. Uh, and to make it a full gauntlet. I don't know. I don't know. I, there's, I don't think there's anything wrong with it not reaching a full gauntlet. Like, I think that it just, it, it serves, it serves what it needed to do. Um, you know what? It could have been, I, you know what? To make it a full gauntlet, I think it would have been cool to kind of see all the secrets she kind of revealed through her actions, like the sacrifice she made by putting everything in the Winter Soldier out on out there. And I remember that movie ending with like, uh, with uh, uh, Robert Redford saying, "You know, that means all your past is going to be out there." And to mm-hmm. be fair, there are still things of her past we haven't seen. We haven't seen Sao Paulo. We haven't seen hospital fire we haven't seen any of that stuff so i would have loved to seen a little bit more like like she could have been the web that like uh, unveils mutants like she could have done the, she could have unveiled the weapon x program because she knew about it like that to me like those little things could have really elevated the whole thing into to a gauntlet experience but in the end i get why they i get why they did what they did and they gave me what they wanted or what, I, what they gave me something I I still loved in the long run. Yeah, uh, they I think they gave us what we needed, and it didn't feel like they were ticking off boxes of references that have been made to her past. Yeah, that, that could have been an easy trap to fall into. It's like, well, somebody once brought up the time she was in Scotland, so quick, let's talk about Scotland. Like, it didn't feel like they were trying to do that. Um, well, I ended up giving it an Infinity Gauntlet. Oh I, my god! Yeah, I am adoring Black Widow, uh, and I'm not the only one. This uh, this picture raked in 80 million on opening weekend, Ryan, and an additional 60 in Disney Plus premiere access purchases. So it's I don't know what the budget was. It's not as ginormous as an Avengers film. So I think it's safe to say that this opening weekend was huge for Black Widow. So I, and I think it mm-hmm. earned every penny. I think all the money is up there on the screen. Um, it, it's it, I had no idea what I wanted out of a Black Widow movie because I didn't know what her story was. Um, all I knew was I was getting Florence Pugh, who I love, and I was getting the swan song for this character who I've seen for so long. And it delivered on all of those. And it it's topped itself in ways that I wasn't expecting by being quiet, by being under the radar, just like Natasha herself. And it it made me appreciate the character so much more. And I think that when you have a character who's been part of a huge franchise and then you give them a spin-off film, usually it just tends to make you sick of that character. Yeah. You know, it's like, uh, I can't even think of a good example right now but maybe maybe like the x-men origins wolverine movie it's like wow i was loving wolverine but i really didn't need this no thanks yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh that's that's sort of the default when it comes to these kind of spin-offs. and this did exactly the opposite this made me appreciate her so much that now i'm gonna watch her in those other movies in a totally different way and that's the mm-hmm. perfect way to do it. So I, I could not have, have asked for a better Black Widow movie. Infinity Gauntlet, lock it in. It's there. Wow. Well, we definitely see this movie in different lights, that's for sure. But uh, but in the end, don't get me, like I said, don't get me wrong, guys. Love it. I, I did love it. I think it's an amazing movie. Guys, Ryan I, hates Black Widow. 
it's i as a marvel fan it's it's just i yeah i just as as a comic book fan there's a little bit more i could have could have could have could have gotten from a movie like that but in i i'm very happy with what i got don't get me wrong sam beautiful movie beautiful story and a beautiful end to a wonderful character Ryan, we we haven't done this in a long time, but we have a, a grave to add to our. Oh my cemetery. God, we do! It's finally have, finally the time has come. It has finally come. We have Drakov's grave, and I don't even know if I'm spelling his name right. But Drakov blew up in a big old helicopter fire. Chopper. Um, he, he got blew up in the chopper. What uh, what do you suppose Drakov's grave? is like uh man <laughs> it's kind of a phrase that widow had uh man those do stay <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow yeah because they you know the widows they shoot their stingers and mm-hmm. yeah i like it and i think it should come with uh like the 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 whole tombstone is covered with this spray that when you get close enough to it, you can't deface the tombstone because you smell it and it <laughs> stops you from. So he'll it'll never be vandalized by punks. That's it. That's it's it. Very specific. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, hundred percent. I love it. I mean, yeah, I, I actually, you know, just to quickly wrap that, that was a clever way to defeat a villain. I mean, it was brutal to watch, but Oof. it was a good way. I, I can't, whenever I watch a, like a character willingly harm themselves to accomplish something, I'm just like, that's always the point where I'm like, I don't think I could do that. Like, I, I don't know if you've ever read the Stephen King book, The Stand. Have you read that book? There, there's a scene in that book where there's a lady who, like the bad guy, he's like this really powerful guy and he's trying to capture her alive, but she can't let him capture her alive or it'll ruin everything. So she tries to jump out a window to kill herself but he catches her before she can fall. Uh, And she's like, well, I have to kill myself or he's going to, you know, everything's going to be ruined. So the window is still shattered. So she like throws her neck on a piece of the glass and I'm, I'm reading, I'm like, I, I could not be this brave. If my, like, I could not be this brave. (laughs) That's intense, man. Yeah. It's gross. (laughs) Well, on that note, that was Black Widow. Do you have any final thoughts, Ryan, before we call it um, a name? You know what? Here's what I will say. As, as a movie that kicked off Phase 4, uh, tone, feeling, um, sorry, tone, performances, uh, action, uh, this, was a, this was still a great way to kick off Phase 4. I'm happy to see the movies make a return. Uh, we're, we're in full production swing of seeing movies till, till December um so yes like just give me more marvel i'm uh, happy this movie exists i'm so so proud to finally add it to the mcu lineup um and just yeah let's just keep going and we got loki coming up uh you know at the time of this recording loki uh the final episode will be happening this wednesday and then we get a two-week break i think before the uh for uh what if or maybe it's three weeks but uh what if is the next one which is good because I have a lot of work stuff coming up. So I appreciate that break, Marvel. It's almost <laughs> like you're timing this on our behalf. I love it. Yes. Wow. Well, that has been Black Widow, my friend. Thank you so much for for rambling on with me about this excellent Marvel movie. And you're right. We're back. We're back. Phase four is here. Finally. Dear God. Finally. Long, but we're finally here. Even though I guess WandaVision was technically the beginning. It just doesn't. It, it feels like it's really here now. Um, but yeah, and it, like you said, it's all like, there's so much more coming. There are like a bajillion movies coming in 2021 alone. So we're all set. You can find us here. Ryan, where can they find you when you're not here? When I, when I'm not living in the, when I'm magically not living in the wonderful world of Marvel, which is like never, uh, (laughs) but you can find me on Twitter at crusader online and you can find me on Twitch at twitch.tv forward slash Xbox Canada. Mm. And you can find me on Instagram and Twitter sometimes at Andrew Fantasia. Uh, and you can also find me hiding out in the woods 
um, walking and talking along to the scenes of Moonraker like a boss, just like Natasha. Uh, and then, of course, on Rebel Scum Podcast, talking about Star Wars. And uh, if you join the Rebel Scum Podcast Patreon, you can get a whole bunch of cool stuff. And I'm not saying Scarlett Johansson's really a Patreon, but I'm also not saying she's not a Patreon. So maybe yeah. if you join, you'll see the names of all the Patreons and you'll find out if she is. Uh, but in that, in the meantime, until then, everybody, do svidania, and please have a marvelous day. Hey, scumbags. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up on our video. As always, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Rebel Scum Podcast, for all the latest videos.